Okay, we are live uh, with Chase's ceiling and a nice picture on the wall. Up. Oh, do I see um, a third person in the background? All right, so Trish, re refresh that browser window with the everyone's going to listen to me do some tech support for okay. instance. All right, so on the second computer, just refresh the YouTube browser window. Do you see that there's now a live video? YouTube.com slash FCP02. And you got 20 people watching your every move right now. Oh, God. High, high pressure. It is high pressure, and I can't find my mouse. <laughs> <laughs> hey, will you get the, the yellow tablet while you're out there? What's up, everybody? Sorry for the technical difficulties. Obviously, uh, stereotypical stoner stuff and uh, being late to the party. Is this how you run your cannabis operations? Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> My personal life is a complete different ball game altogether. Right. It's like the, uh, the shoemaker's children, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, did you find this cursor yet? I didn't even look for you it. You didn't even look for it? <laughs> I figured you were getting the mouse. Okay. You guys, you, guys are in, you guys are in Oklahoma right now, right? Yep, we are yes. in Edmond, Oklahoma, which is the suburbs of Oklahoma City. God damn, is anybody not? My, it's like Mecca. Is anyone not moving to Oklahoma? Yeah, the reason why everybody has desire to be in Oklahoma is because there's no cap here and there's no barriers to entry. So it allows every Tom, Dick and Harry that's ever used cannabis to be able to jump into the industry. Um, roughly twenty five hundred dollar entry fee, five hundred dollars for your criminal background check and then a piece of commercially zoned land. And you're off to the races in Oklahoma. So with with that being said, extremely uh, challenging. Um, to be able to be viable as the little guy, um, just because there are bigger entities here. But at the same time, best practices are something that is important to do regardless if you're a home cultivator or if you're a commercial producer. Um, I have a little bit different thought processes in regards to home cultivation versus commercial cultivation. Um, when you're growing for yourself, family members, your loved ones, your inner circle, um, you know, there's certain standards and certain things that you're willing to accept. When you're growing for the masses, you need to be held to a higher standard, in my opinion. Um, and the reason for that is we have to look at states like Oklahoma that is not a recreational market yet. It is a medical market. So it's extremely imperative to think about the people and the reason why we even got to the point that we're at within the language and within the state's cannabis community, because without the patients, um, you know, we're not really uh, even on the map as far as uh, what's going on in the global scene. Um, when it comes to cannabis from every single state, there's differences that you're going to see um, from every single state from pesticide tests through just standard compliance and the fact that there's no standardization between one operation to the next from state to state is very disconcerting. And the reason for that is because what happens whenever we start to look at a, a legal market whenever you can cross state lines? Um, when that happens, it's going to allow the big players to be able to come in, operate at a loss like a standard business can anywhere from five to you know 10 years before they even think about bringing in any type of revenue, which is extremely difficult for the smaller operator. Um, most small operations have been geared in Oklahoma towards trying to turn a profit from their very first harvest, which um, for the ones that have grown cannabis throughout their lives, that's extremely difficult. Um, a good grower usually takes them one turn to be able to figure out their environment. A cultivator that is very new to cannabis, um, even with automation, it's going to take them usually three times before they start to figure out the drying and curing conditions, um, dialing in a plant, having too many plants in a room, um, having space within your room to be able to actually work around your plants. I know that overcrowding is a tremendous issue and I'm going to start going over a, a couple of slides that I have um, in regards to all this, but ultimately um, I want to talk about the good, the bad and the ugly that's happening within the Oklahoma market. And this is something that is actually 
um, pretty prone to the rest of the United States. So Oklahoma isn't special to all of this, but at the same time, Oklahoma is a good representation of the cannabis community because it all starts with the smaller operations, the mom and pop facilities, and then obviously it scales from there. So anyways, here we go. So this. Right. So, so just quickly, uh, Trish, it's not critical that you guys uh, look at the chat right now because I, I, I got to run up and put uh, Valentina, give Valentina the bad news that it's time for nap time. So try, try to start share the screen again. And then, uh, Chad, what I was going to do is have you jump in on StreamYard with me as an administrator. Um, but let me do that in like five minutes when I uh, come back. So try, try, try to share your screen again because it stopped sharing. Here. Right here? Yes. Everybody bear with us. And then choose screen and there you go. Or window, actually, go to the window. There you go. Okay, here it comes. Boom. All right. So I'm going to, I'll be back. Why don't you just present like your at everybody's favorite cannabis conference up on stage presenting to a, an audience of eager learners. Here's the okay. chats right here. Okay. So you can see it. So I just put it on my phone for you. Okay. So full transparency, cannabis community, this is the first time that I have ever done any type of um, chat like this. So this is an interesting learning process for me. So anyways, bear with me. We'll get through it. I promise I am not that crazy. But at the same time, um, back to what I was saying um, in regards to being able to harvest. Yes, you can turn a profit that very first harvest. But where you're at from the very first harvest to where you're at three turns in is a considerable difference. Um, every single time that you grow the same cultivar of cannabis over and over and over, you're going to start dialing that cultivar in. You're going to start realizing, hey, does it take up this amount of water per day? Does it take up, you know, this much nutrients? Does it not like this much nitrogen? Does it like a little bit more phosphorus? And all the things that really are contingent upon finishing a plan out really strong and being able to have the things that we consider to be a top shelf product versus, you know, the horrible mid grade that you know, people want to uh, talk about stuff. So anyways, the first slide, when we get to this, let's see. I'm trying to get to this. Mm -hmm. Is going to be my Jeff or my friend, Jeff Grindstaff's uh, Arise plant. He used this for breeding. This is from Steep Hill Labs out of New Mexico. Um, this is a stereotypical cultivar that the general public is going after. This is going to be something that's going to be almost 36% THC, which is going to get you over that 30% threshold. Um, that's kind of the golden goose when it comes to cannabis cultivars. But what I found as a breeder myself is that when you put so much of one thing into a plant, when you have a really high THC, what's going to potentially suffer from that cultivar? And that's usually going to be the experience that's associated with it. Um, terpenes, flavonoids, um, the way it smokes. How many times have we had a cultivar that looks really good and it you know, checks all the boxes, but then when we go to smoke it, we're completely disappointed because it doesn't taste the same way that it smells. And then it doesn't burn clean. It doesn't have that nice white ash that we're all looking for. These are the things that you know is what we consider to be quality within the cannabis world. But at the same time, for me, I don't really care about how much THCA is in a cultivar. I really care about terpenes, minor cannabinoids. So five years ago, I was just like Jeff and I was breeding for high numeric cultivars. Um, since hand, since I've been in Oklahoma, I've been breeding primarily for um, terpenes and minor cannabinoids. She's 
Khalifa says, do you ever deal with pests other than gnats? So Oklahoma has a, a very interesting um, integrated pest management protocol that's needed. That's really the most important person that needs to be hired with every single facility, regardless if you are in retail, if you're a processor, and definitely if you're in cultivation. Um, I tell business owners all the time that is literally the first person that you hire. And the reason for that is because say that you go out to a rural area in Oklahoma and you decide that you want to grow um, cannabis. Um, you know, the first thing you have to do is clear the land. Um, if you don't clear that land properly and you push all that debris, tree material, organic material to a big pile, you're going to create a home for every type of wildlife that is existing and living in the area. So it's extremely important to be able to clear a spot where you can access your operation and your IPM needs to start from the perimeter of your facility and then work its way in. Um, a lot of times I go to operations, the only thing that they talk about is, you know, the plants, you know, spider mites on this plant, fungus gnats in this room. And I ask them, well, what are you doing on the perimeter of the building? because most of the time when it comes to grows, we're the ones that bring pathogens into the facility. We're the ones that open the door and allow the bugs to be able to come in. Those are the things that are usually going to infect operations. I tell people that you have to look at every operation that it's contaminated from the very get go. Did we lose the, uh, I think we lost the screen share. Can you guys still see the screen share? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I just made it big again. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So anyways, this is Jeff's. This is a, a perfect example of what the masses are going after. This is something that uh, I've had a chance to be able to grow outdoors. Um, this is a great plant for Oklahoma. So shameless plug to my friend, uh, Jeff Grindstaff at iRe Genetics. Um, he is made some really wonderful cultivars that have worked really well in my experience in the Oklahoma uh, market, regardless if you're growing indoors, greenhouses, or outdoor cultivation, which outdoor is extremely challenging in Oklahoma also because you get to the microbials and yeah. failing. That, was for, that, was for indoor. that was for an indoor grow. So this next cultivar here is some of the bad practices that I have seen in Oklahoma. So this was from an year and from an outdoor grow in 2019. Um, Oklahoma had a bad bit of winter weather that came in and snowed on everyone's outdoor crop. So on their Instagram page, they literally had them on their four wheelers going out to the field and cutting these things down with a big machete. Um, it was really gruesome just because they were throwing the plants in the back of a, a trailer and the back of a U-Haul like it was nothing. Um, you know, it didn't matter if they had bugs on it, didn't matter if it had snow on it, didn't matter what it had on it because it was all getting piled in there and it was just getting just stripped off and thrown into bags. So unfortunately, um, when you talk about fresh frozen, that's something that's really important because most people don't get their product frozen within the amount of time that you're actually able to retain your terpenes. Your terpenes are something that are so volatile that as soon as you cut your plant down, you're on a time frame, which I know that most processors and people that are doing ice water hash are going to want it within a two hour window. I like to go over and beyond that and try to get it within an hour, whether or not you have nitrogen and you're able to freeze the product or you have some type of deep refrigeration and freezer to be able to freeze that product in a relatively fast amount of time. So you're definitely against the clock when it comes to freezing the material to be able to get it to the temperature that's needed to be able to have a really nice live product or a fresh frozen rosin. So I'm not personally a big fan of uh, ice water hash rosin. I know that it's really trendy. I'm, I'm kind of old fashioned from the standpoint that I like Charis, um, which is finger hash. I definitely will still uh, do some uh, dry sift. Um, but as far as ice water hash rosin, I, I think that once you press it, th there's something that, that changes in my opinion. Uh, maybe I just haven't had something that I've really, really enjoyed. Um, but I've had hash in multiple places throughout the world. Um, so 
With that being said, this is something that was very disheartening for us because we saw that they failed for microbials. So they, they failed for E. coli. Um, once that was said, we told the business owner, hey, you know, this product has to be discarded. It can't be used for commercial production. So instead of them listening to me and discarding this product, obviously they weren't set up with the infrastructure to be able to work with failed material. Um, this was a cultivation facility that was doing ice water hash and rosin. So they didn't have the ability to be able to work um, with material that is going to fail like this. So with that being said, they hadn't developed any type of relationship that was needed at the same time to be able to work this kind of material. So it was definitely a challenge. I told them, hey, you know, your best point at this point is to throw this material away or to discard it because they had so much biomass to produce them. I want to say they had like 2000 pounds that were just sitting in a freezer. In Oklahoma, it's required that you have 10 pound batch limits. So what most people do, um, depending on if you are outdoor or if you're an indoor grower, is you're going to try to get 10 pounds of usable buds if you're indoor. If you're a greenhouse, you're going to do the same thing. And then when it comes to outdoor, you're going to try to buck those plants as much as possible, de-leaf them as much as possible, and really just focus on the biomass because, again, for every 10 pounds, you're supposed to get a compliance test for that. So when it comes to failed tests, it's extremely important that you start looking at the overall picture. And with the overall picture, you know, how many cultivars were in that San Fernando Valley OG? Was it one? Was it two? Was it 10? Was it 30? We don't know. We just have a test for San Fernando Valley OG. So for me, I think that there could have been 30 cultivars or phenos of the exact same cut and they're just thrown out into the same you know farm um i don't know i wasn't at the original farm that farmed this but i know that at first when oklahoma first went live um, it was an arms race um, still is everybody is trying to figure out what works well and what conditions in oklahoma and everyone's trying to really uh ride the hype train of what's going on at the west coast and the, the fact of the matter is that you have to select your cultivars for the geographic area that you're operating in. Um, you're going to have a different climate everywhere you go. Your microbials are going to be different everywhere you go. So you have to kind of work your soil and you need to know what you're starting with. Um, e. coli was probably formed just due to the fact that they had an excessive amount of water um, I have no idea, so I would be guessing at best. I would say really probably the way that they handled it was probably the, the poor way um, in which it was stored, which was the cause of E. coli. E. coli is one of those things that will um, present itself whenever you have um, dingy, dirty, dusty conditions and stuff not being. So if you fill one test, you have to get rid of it. At least no there's, no, there's ways to remediate. No, th there's absolutely ways to remediate. So, um, you know, when, when it comes to that, it just depends on what you're wanting to do. Because if you have a bunch of cultivars for every 10 pounds that you get, you know, if you have multiple cultivars in there, really it boils down to what kind of plant health you have. If your cultivars are sick, um, then obviously you want to be constantly selecting. Selecting should be happening regardless of where you're at. If you're growing a plant at home as a med patient or if you're growing at a commercial level, you should always be constantly selecting and removing any type of genetics that are showing any signs of stress or decay or um, loss of vigor, anything that will really help you to have the, the closest thing to a healthy stock because you want to have the ability to be able to have a lab test that will test within these certain parameters every single time. Um, how many cultivars that you have where you'll see one test is at 24.97%, the next time you see it will be at 35% or roughly 30% THC and it's the exact same plant. So it's extremely important to see, um, you know, what happens over multiple runs, and that's where data really comes in as well. Um, 
I tell everyone that in Oklahoma, when it comes to your IPM or your integrated pest management, that it needs to start with the outside perimeter of your facility. Um, this right here is two different types of aphids. So the one on the left is going to be your root aphids. Um, the one on the right is going to be just your, your standard green aphids. Um, this is later on last year. Um, this was a grow that was not doing anything except for spraying um, neem once a week. So um, I don't really know how effective their application rate was, but whenever you see stuff like this, for me, it's definitely a sign that there was cleanliness issues going on and that there wasn't that general inspection. Um, the first thing you need to do every time you go to your facility is, you know, once you come into your facility, you have been contaminated and you need to decontaminate yourself. That's where it's important to be able to change your clothes, change your shoes, um, having your dog in a grow. Um, think about how many grows that you potentially have your dog um, bringing stuff in because your dog goes outside, uses the bathroom, lays in the grass and then comes back in and then you rub on your dog and then you go back to playing with your plants. Um, something that easily happens, but you know, I'm guilty of doing it too. But in commercial facilities, it's not something that is able to be done because when you have a significant higher plant count, um, you're able to miss things and it's harder to be able to get your hands on every single plant. That's where automation is important, but at the same time, it's not necessary. Um, depending on where you're at within scale. I think that um, once you start to scale, things become a lot more challenging for you. Uh, but whenever you're just a home patient and you're growing your plant count, that uh, you should be able to get your hands on every single plant daily and really know what's going on. So before you really jump into the commercial game, you definitely need to, to learn the fundamentals of cannabis, which um, in Oklahoma, since there's no barriers to entry, everyone kind of did the old figure it out as you go um, mentality, which we're starting to see more facilities that are doing things correctly. But at first um, I was literally in, in hundreds of commercial facilities and it was extremely disheartening to see some of the practices that were going on because I would see stuff like this, which to the average person, they would think, Hey, this is just trichome production. Um, realistically, this is powdery mildew growth. Um, as you can see, this is actually something that I don't remember the magnification exactly. Um, I think that this was through like a jeweler's loop and I just took the cell phone and took a picture of it. Um, but you can even see that the trichome heads that are potentially in there, uh, most of the bulbs have been broken off. So this plant had been extremely stressed. Um, the powdery mildew, was starting to get pretty evasive to the point where it was actually creeping into the buds. It wasn't just growing on the leaves anymore in spots. It was getting into the buds where you can't cut it out. Um, for me, this is material that would be composted out. This isn't something that I would try to remediate and, and push to the public. But I also understand that a lot of people um, don't have the same ethics that my wife and I do in regards to cannabis. For us, it's all about the patient. It's all about providing quality medicine to everybody and not cutting corners, doing the right thing, making sure that, hey, if a mistake is made, um, sometimes you just have to take it on the chin as a business owner. It's the cost of doing business correctly. I don't think that uh, Tesla did everything correctly. I don't think Apple's done everything correctly. Obviously, the U.S. government doesn't do everything correctly. So, you know, why are most business owners? But at the same time, best practices are something that you want to try to mitigate. So, oops. Oh, sorry. So these two pictures um, are two separate issues. So the plant on the left is actually from fungus gnat damage. Um, that was the worst case of fungus gnat damage that I have ever seen in my life. Um, this was a commercial operation that was your stereotypical size in Oklahoma, which is gonna be anywhere from about 1,000 to 10,000 square feet. Um, standard process where you have too many plants in a room, didn't have the ability to be able to get an eye on the plants and see what was really going on. 
fungus knot started getting into the room, once the fungus gnat started uh, proliferating and breeding, started getting out of control, started affecting nutrient uptake, which as you can see, this plant looks like it has numerous deficiencies. What has happened is, is they use a three gallon pot. Cocoa was what was used as the medium. Then after that, the roots were exploding out the bottom of the container. So roots were exposed. So the fungus gnats weren't even going in from the top side anymore. They were going from where the drainage area was. And they were going in and I tried everything that I can think of at first to be able to eliminate these things. So ended up um, getting in contact with an entomologist from Oklahoma State University and developing an IPM protocol that would allow us to still be organic at this operation. Uh, it wouldn't allow us to spray anything that we didn't want to. Um, we were able to save this entire grow and we only lost one plant through this entire process. So I have pictures of the grow later on that we'll get into, um, but this is where we were day one working with this particular operation. Um, the bud on the right is a greenhouse grown um, bud. This bud is suffering from botrytis, which you can- Nematodes would help, yes. Yes, so yes, ab nematodes. absolutely nematodes would work. Um, but at the same time, it, it's all about what type of application rate you can have with a nematode. So depending with essential oils. So and, and in regards to all the things that, you know, someone's trying to use, um, I've been growing cannabis my entire adult life. So I'm 41 years old. So for me, when I learned how to grow cannabis, I didn't have great things like the Future Cannabis Project to be able to learn stuff. I had to learn everything the hard way. Um, I made more mistakes through the process than things correctly. So um, I've spent a tremendous amount of money. Um, I actually didn't give a brief history of myself. So that's just the nervousness. <laughs> <laughs> so I apologize that I didn't actually even give a proper introduction with myself. So um, anyways, we'll finish talking about this button, then I'll go over a brief history of myself. So I apologize for that, just the, the nerves of me doing this for the first time. And yes, diatomaceous earth works as well. Yes, but with diatomaceous earth, once it becomes wet, it yeah. deactivates it. So it's extremely good to use as a topper. Um, if you're doing an ebb and flow and doing a, um, you know, a drain and fill, you can use diatomaceous earth. Um, but if you are top watering and then you're putting diatomaceous earth after the fact, if you're not letting it dry, you're kind of deactivating it. And I've literally seen where you'll get that caking on the top of your media and fungus gnats and other flying creatures will literally just walk around on it like it's nothing. Same with the, the gnat mix. Yeah. Oh, and be careful with the diatomaceous earth because um, depending on how you apply it, it could fuck up your your uh, fans and <laughs> your HVAC system. I kind of yeah, so, learned that the wrong way. Yeah, so, way. so some few years ago, we went into a facility and we dusted everything down with diatomaceous earth and we <laughs> didn't realize that... And, you know, the plants hadn't gone into flower. So we thought that we had the ability to be able to just powder the room down. <laughs> Unfortunately, it got into the fans. Um, since we had multiple turns in the room, the fans were starting to get sticky and they weren't clean properly, which, you know, again, that was pre us. But at the same time, you have to walk into a grow and say, hey, this is what I have to work with. Assess what's going on and um, do the best with what you have. So. Um, I think reality will jump in and slap you in the face most of the time because a lot of us at the commercial level, we want all of these things that we see on Instagram. We want to have this big, beautiful GMP facility, but at the same time, what's the reality of being able to afford that? Um, that project could potentially be tens of millions of dollars to be able to do something correctly. Uh, but at the same time, once you do something correctly like that, you have the ability to be able to operate at the federal level once that hey, it's just... what once that happens which um you know will be definitely an interesting thing but anyways this bud on the right is botrytis or the beginning of botrytis um i don't know if you can see my cursor here but you can see in this area is starting to form which the, the best way for me to kind of really start assessing botrytis is the terpenes will kind of express themselves um, in, in these areas. It's usually whenever you have 
the drying out of buds or like a bud that has some type of damage where you don't have that moisture going to that bud anymore and that calyx that it starts to dry on the vine per se and once that starts to happen you have the ability to smell the terpenes of the plant but at the same time since that botrytis is still growing you obviously don't want to use that product um, that's known as bud rot for the ones that don't know um, Trish and I have also worked in commercial facilities designing everything from your high-tech facilities by our standards um, this is more of an automated system. This is using a system called GrowLink. Um, shout out to them, another shameless plug. Um, this was for a facility in, in Lawton that we do not have a good relationship with. Um, this is something that I actually wanted to, um, to bring to the cannabis community that um, when you get into the cannabis game, I think that everyone has different intent. Um, and, and for us, it's all about intent when it comes to cannabis. Um, for us, we look at cannabis as a service and not necessarily something that we monetize. Um, obviously, we do have to make a living. We don't want to be, you know, in a car that breaks down. We want an air conditioner to work and stuff like that. And we want the same thing that everyone else does. But we don't expect to get rich off of cannabis. Um, Trish and I were involved in the activism of cannabis. We were on the team that pushed Missouri language from 2014 all the way up to 2018. Um, that's where Trish and I met each other. Um, once we had a chance to be able to meet each other, we worked on projects, um, being able to build vertically integrated operations, um, everything from R&D facilities through your standard grow operation that would have your um, standard environmentals controlled, having your fans um, that are going to be different. This is more of a racetrack style um, here than what you see where you have the oscillating fans that go back and forth. So this is kind of a newer technology. Um, but at the same time, what I also see with a picture like this is you see, what was that? The people looking been... to be millionaires. The wrong reasons. <laughs> Oh, ab absolutely. The, there's, you know, a, a lot of, <laughs> well, it's, it, it is what it is. But anyways, you even can look at a facility like this, which to most people, they're like, oh, this is really nice. This is really sophisticated. But what I see with this is the return air is, is right here. So, and then if you look at where your air is being dumped into the room being right here. So this horse track system where we change the direction of the fans in the room. So it's supposed to be going around in a big circle. Um, we changed these things to be able to spread the air disbursement out in the room because what was happening was air was coming out from the air conditioner. The fans were circulating it around the room in a circle. And guess what? So it would come down. This fan was faced the other direction. It would hit this wall and this fan was facing to the right and it would pull the air to the right and it would pull that freshly cooled air back into the return air. And then it would be blowing around this warm air from the lights all around the room. So this room had temperature issues. Um, on top of that, you can see that there are sliding and rolling tables here in this facility. Um, the problem with this is that there's no way to work. Um, you have to work one aisle at a time. Um, you know, that's extremely difficult whenever you have this room full of plants. Um, it's like two feet. Yeah. I believe that was the working space was two feet. So, and it kept collapsing on us too. So whenever I was working in it, it would just squeeze me in. <laughs> And my wife isn't a big person, so I'm roughly around 200 pounds, and I was constantly having to shove the tables away from themselves. Um, I know that that's a leveling issue, but at the same time, this is the reality of a lot of operations because whenever you take a pre-existing building and you try to convert it to a cannabis operation, you inherently are already starting with a challenge. Um, because you're trying to engineer something that wasn't really meant for that particular area. So being able to start from a from scratch or a blank palette um, is the best way to be able to actually design a canvas grow that is going to be conducive to success. So obviously these guys will eventually figure it out. Um, they, they have to 
go through things the hard way, just like everybody else. Can you help people in other states to build the right space? Oh, absolutely. So um, a little bit about myself. I'm a, a third generation breeder from the state of Hawaii. Um, I've worked in the cannabis industry in California, Alaska, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Missouri, and now Oklahoma. Um, Oklahoma has been the biggest challenge. Um, and the reason why is because there's not been any barriers to entry. So Missouri, for example, um, it literally costs the same amount of money to attempt to apply for a license as it does to be able to acquire all four licenses in Oklahoma on the cultivation side. So that's just to throw your name in the, in the hat. That doesn't guarantee you a license. Um, Oklahoma, you know, as long as you are um, able to pay that $2,500 to OMA, able to give the $500 to the um, OBNDD. OBNDD, which does the criminal background check. And then after that, um, once you're commercially zoned for ag or commercial um, operations, you're off to the races. So it's allowed every Tom, Dick and Harry to be able to enter the industry. And unfortunately, just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. Um, and if you are going to do something, you need to do it right. Um, the only reasons why Trish and I aren't um, doing this um, at the Oklahoma scale is because we understand what it takes to be able to operate um, once federal legalization happens. And I understand that that's definitely forward thinking. But at the same time, if you're an operation that is not gearing towards that as of right now, you are definitely behind the times. Um, once federal legalization opens up and we have the ability to be able to move product across state lines, you look at a state like Missouri that has a tremendous um, issue with being able to source product right now. There's more patients in the state than there are commercial operations producing cannabis. Now, that's something that will change over time. But as of right now, they're getting just exuberant prices for their cannabis versus Oklahoma that is actually below the national average for cannabis just because we have just as many commercial growers in Oklahoma as California. But the difference is you're looking at a state with 40 million versus a state with four. Um, so that is a big challenge, but at the same time, it allows everybody to be able to play. So it kind of puts everyone in an equal um, capacity, but at the same time, it's not equal because it all boils down to what kind of capital you have and how you can jump out ahead of everybody else. So, yes, that's actually something that I, I really wanted to talk about um, is the fact that we need standardization. Um, when a new state comes online, Yes, you have um, different things that states actually go after, but when it comes to, let's see, I actually wrote this down on something. Okay, so Colorado currently is testing for 13 pesticides. Oregon's testing for 59. California's testing for 66. Canada is going over and beyond their testing for 96. And then you have the AOAC International, which I don't necessarily know what that is. So um, don't judge me for that. Um, <laughs> but they're actually developing methods to test for 104 different pesticides. So with that being said, I'm definitely an organic grower, but I also understand that when it comes to being able to scale, um, what I've not seen on the Future Cannabis Project is an organic grow that is at scale. Um, I've seen things that are kind of like this facility. This facility is roughly 25,000 square feet. Uh, I've not seen anybody do that at a bigger scale. So I, I'm definitely uh, excited to see somebody do it. Um, just because of the machinery that it takes to be able to move your compost is so tremendously challenging. Uh, I mean, that's when you have to have the big John Deere. Um, I don't even know how to drive those things. So uh, a forklift is about as far as my skill set goes, but I've always wanted to go out into a field and figure out how to drive one of those things. Yeah, I have seen Steve Catwell. He's the, uh, the MMA fighter, isn't he? So anyways, with this facility, there's even a yes. bunch of... Okay. 
<laughs> so with this facility, I, again, I, I look at things that are wrong with it and you see the big trip hazard. So what that is designed is, I guess, a, a wannabe French drain that they're trying to be able to have those tables that are sliding back and forth or left to right. And there's trying to direct the water. Um, the problem is that obviously that is not OSHA compliant. That is not handicap accessible. Um, whether or not, you know, that's going to happen with cannabis is, you know, neither here nor there. But at the same time, I think that this is one of those things that you should be prepping for. This thing should really be built into the ground. Um, so that way someone in a wheelchair can get over this and have accessibility. So when it comes to designing these things in the future, these are things that you want to think about. Um, when it comes to multi-tiered grows, those are another thing that I haven't really seen. I know that I have uh, said a lot of things in the, the chat on the Future Cannabis Project about um, vertically tiered grows and the microclimates that are produced. Um, I've not seen a manifold that's been able to really uh, control the air and not affect each one of those levels. It seems like on the, the tiered grows for every level, you slowly kind of decline in how the quality of the product is. So anyways, um, this was eventually removed. Is that the girl? Is that girl you're talking about? The one that was next to Oki okay, and Edmund got the guys and Karen were talking about this Atticus. No, that, that is not. So um, I, I do remember that operation as well. Um, that was just a, another learning curve type situation. Um, you know, I don't like to talk bad about people's skill sets. And I think that it all boils down to infrastructure and what they're working with. That the, the bigger you get, you know, and if you're hand watering, you know, 200 plants becomes extremely challenging for, for one person once they're all in flower, and especially if you start getting big behemoth plants that need, you know, a significant amount of care. Um, you know, what people don't see with all these Instagram videos and, and stuff is what it really takes to be able to produce that final product and that there is a tremendous difference between the ones that are doing it right versus the ones that are just doing it. Um, you know, this is a vertical tiered grow. So what, what, what do you see with this? For me, I see a lot of VOCs being created. I see a lot of places where powdery mildew pathogens can harbor. And the fact that you're using wood, I mean, you know, that's the, the biggest no-no um, when it comes to long-term growth. Um, some areas of the country, you know, you do have building code that you actually have to abide by. Oklahoma has been extremely surprising to us because depending on what country or not country, what county you're in, uh, as long as you don't kill yourself or others, you are kind of free game to do whatever you want to. VOC is volatile organic compounds. You can explain more about that if you want. Yeah. So, um, Anything that's organic over time is going to break down. So whenever something starts to break down, um, it will start to produce gases. And it's the reason why whenever you're composting that it gets hot. Um, whenever you go out and you're making a compost mound, that's why you're going out there and churning that because you're taking the microbial life and you're moving it around because it starts to heat up. When stuff starts to decay, it starts to increase in temperature. Um, so those are things that are really imperative when it comes to designing and building a grow is that you want to try to use something that is going to, um, you know, repel the water as much as possible. That's why you see FRP being used in kitchens quite a bit. Um, you also see uh, tiles, stuff of that nature. Obviously, when it comes to concrete floors, I like to see floor drains. I like to see siller that's put on there. Um, they have stuff that's kind of similar to like a yeah yeah so yeah. so um we actually found like a gypsum type um it's like a gypsum mix i can't think of do you remember the name of the uh, i don't remember what the name of the product is but there's some I'm products thinking. that that are out now that you can essentially it's kind of like kills it's a little bit more expensive for it um, but you can just put it in a normal paint sprayer and apply it the same way that you would conventionally do things. Um, and it doesn't admit that the VOCs and allows you to be able to do things from pressure washing your walls <laughs> to scrubbing on things. Sorry, that last comment made me laugh. 
<laughs> oh, um, I, I'm not going to say anything to that here, last next, comment. Next but anyway, <laughs> this right here is one of the few operations in Oklahoma that are doing things correctly. Um, this was a building that was a GMP built. GM motor. A GM motors, GMP built building. Um, and they released um, some type of GM products out of here at one time before Detroit was like the main hub. This is out of Oklahoma City. Um, so this has been converted over. Um, shout out to uh, the friends over at Nextleaf, um, the, the Spencers and the, the rest of the team. Um, they have tissue culture in this facility. Um, they're doing everything in-house. Uh, they're keeping this thing under lock and key. Um, as you can see, everything's built like a shit brick house. So everything's concrete, everything's floor drained, everything is is built to be able to last. Obviously, they have a mini power plant in there, and this thing was in here before this thing was even uh, built for cannabis operations. So, you know, if you are going to take over an existing operation um, and convert it over and not be starting from scratch, this is what you want to find. So this is kind of the, uh, the diamonds in the rough. And uh, they held on to this piece of property for obvious reasons. This thing has a lot of value, and uh, I wish them a lot of success with their business. So here's another picture. Um, with this picture, what I see is I see all of the open area with all the lighting, the duct work. Um, powdery mildew and other pathogens, I don't see anything that is put in there. You see on the back wall there that they have this like little arrow clean thing to be able you to- can't see your cursor. Oh, you can't see my cursor. <laughs> um, anyways, there is a little- No, we um, can see it. Oh. Oh. Okay, anyways. Oh. <laughs> Where my cursor is, is a little thing that's supposed to be like a little air scrubber. But what you also don't see is the fact that all this duct work is areas that pathogens, other contaminants can potentially hide. So whenever you harvest this room, what are you doing to be able to uh, address this issue? Obviously, you can take apart your, your lights, you can take apart your hood, you can wash your hood, you can take your bulbs out, you know, wipe your bulbs down, handle them all properly, obviously, while wearing gloves and doing all this um, with personal protective equipment on. Uh, but at the same time, you know, unless you have something like a fogging system or you have something that's built internal of this room, um, you know, after a few runs, you're gonna start, especially if you have any type of pathogenic pressure that affects this room, it could potentially um, really wreak havoc just because there's a lot of areas that are very hard to access. So something that you wanna, be able to address but at the same time you know this is still nicer than what i see most of the time making it or breaking it or commercially they have pretty much have to be hydro no um the reason why i prefer hydro is for the the simplicity of it the fact that once you automate it you can Cross. run it you can run it with a lower skill set in oklahoma um, or any new state that comes online, you have a tremendous amount of people that want to get involved in the industry, but you have a lot of people that have been operating in the black market. They've never done something like this at scale. So once you start to scale, um, it, it becomes again, like I was saying, more of a challenge. So, you know, not that Rockwool has its drawbacks. So, you know, the problem with Rockwool is the fact that you have those spaghetti straps. So what are you running in between those spaghetti straps? Are you putting a product like Sanidate in through there to be able to clean those things out? Um, because there are waterborne pathogens that could potentially um, affect your products, which the margin of error when it comes to a hydroponic grow like rock wool, um, cocoa is a little bit more forgiving, um, but when it comes to straight hydroponics, um, you're definitely, um, you, you got to be on top of your game because if you have something go out, you have a chill or die. I mean, your plants can literally be done overnight. Um, and that's why it's important to be able to have an operating system that also allows you to be able to get notifications. So if something does happen, you can say, hey, you know, I, I'm sleeping at two o'clock in the morning. You know, I have a pump that fails. I mean, as a grower or as the director of cultivation, you have to get up and you have to go to work. Yes, yeah, so it was definitely more forgiving. So soil is definitely more forgiving. Um, I think that when it comes to 
Um, learning all this at first, again, it all boils back to fundamentals. Um, when I first learned how to grow cannabis in Hawaii, um, my very first grow was out of a Volkswagen bug. Um, a Volkswagen bug, we literally cut the top off it and we filled it with dirt and we took our plants and we planted them in it and we had a giant chia pet. Um, I didn't take any pictures of that, obviously. Um, at the time, it was still illegal. Um, but you can imagine a old style Volkswagen bug that has a bunch of cannabis plants coming out of the top of it. So just a giant chia pet. Um, but I was able to dry farm at that point, you know, um, where I lived at on the Big Island. Um, it rained every single day, so I literally didn't know about having to add compost or adding synthetic nutrients or any of that stuff. I literally just was like, hey, I just throw this dirt in here and I plant this and then all I have to do is uh, make sure I dry it and, and cure it properly. But I, again, that was before I had access to the Internet and all the tools that we have now to be able to learn. So I saw someone say about ozone. No one cleans with ozone. So there's a bunch of different things on the, the ozone side. So um, in Oklahoma, there is a company called EnviroMist, which they have a stereotypical machine that they put in the duct work that called uses that uses a technique or a technology called plasma air that uses lighting technology to be able to kill any pathogens. Um, I look at a commercial operation um, to be able to have us get traction from the medical community, we have to be able to start producing plants that are consistent every single time, meaning that we have the same dosing with every single product. Trish, will you go grab that bottle of the that liquid stuff that we bought at the dispensary, the 500 milligram stuff? I'm going to show you guys the inconsistencies that, that you have and why these things are so important. So when it comes to other pharmaceuticals, you know, the, the efficacy rate is usually the difference between like, you know, a quarter of a milligram, a half milligram, one milligram, um, you know, stuff comes in 2.5, 5 milligrams, 10 milligrams, which yes, cannabis does come in that setting. But the problem is, is what happens when you have inconsistency with the, the, the product that's being grown. Um, so well, that being said, I have this product. I'm not going to hold it up, but I'm going to just read over the numerics of it. So in a nutshell, this is one of those. I don't know where my thing is. Is it here? Where am I at? No, the camera's right here. Oh, anyways, <laughs> it's one of those uh, THC bombs. It's 500 milligrams, supposedly, but whenever you look to the side of it, the actual true testing numbers is 564 milligrams and 564.14 milligrams. So with that being said, if you got one the first time that was 500 milligrams and the second one being 564 and say that you take half of the bottle um, or a quarter of the bottle that you are going to take a different amount from, you know, batch to batch. And that's the reason why it's hard for a lot of the medical community to be able to really get behind cannabis because they want to be able to say, hey, you know, if I recommend or if I prescribe you two and a half milligrams of this, this is exactly what you take. Um, you know, I, I personally think that eventually it's not going to be a retail thing. I think that it's going to be or retail dispensaries. It's going to be like your your Walmarts, your Targets, your CVS, your Walgreens, um, your, your gas stations will eventually sell cannabis, um, you know, the same way that tobacco and alcohol is sold. Um, and once that happens, I, I do think that, um, you know, these things will be more detrimental to a business being able to actually say, hey, my product is consistent. It's just like McDonald's, regardless if you get a cheeseburger in California or if you go to New York, you know what to expect. Um, in regards to the air cleaning, AeroClean 420 is another, um, another type of technology that helps sanitizes the air. So it's a photocatalytic reactor um, type of technology, which is patented green technology. Um, it doesn't utilize any filters and it creates no ozone. Mm -hmm. so I know that's more of like a green option. 
So in, in regards to it, some of the operations that we've also seen, obviously we've all seen the Blurple. <laughs> the, the, the blurple lights and the little cloner boxes. As you can see with this, what I look at is I see all that debris that's at the bottom of that cloner box. Um, obviously, you can tell that from one round to the next, it looks like they, they might have had a drain on it. But I mean, there's definitely a lot of debris um, and, and stuff like that will ruin your pump. It will clog up your lines. Um, clogging up your emitters. Once your emitters get clogged up, obviously you won't get spray on the, the bottom of your plants. Um, and once you start having that happen, you'll have discrepancies between your success rate. So these are all things that go back to best practices and saying, hey, I need to make sure whenever I do these things that is one, is my air stone clean? Two, did I take apart, you know, my manifold? Did I take apart the emitters? Did I clean all that material out? Um, did I run, you know, some sanitate or something to be able to sanitize all those lines? Because once you have some type of pathogenic pressure that has infected one of your plants, say hop latent viroid, um, you want to make sure that you are able to really kill that thing in its tracks and you need to know where your supply chain is at all times in your chain of custody. So that way at any given time, if you are to have some type of pathogenic pressure, you can stop that thing where it's at and you can literally quarantine everything. So that way it's not affecting your entire grow. Having a grow that is, having a grow that is perpetual is its own unique challenge versus turns. Um, and I've seen a lot of operations that do a couple of different things. One, they will take clones from their current flowering product or their flowering plants. So once they put their plants into flower, they'll go ahead and take all of their clones for their next round. They'll let those things propagate and start during that time frame. And while those plants are growing out, they're vegetative growth them out and they are flowering out the other ones. So with that happening, um, if you are to have some type of pathogenic pressure, it could potentially um, you know, interrupt your whole cycle and you can have a catastrophic loss. This is the importance of why I think people should be looking at, at tissue culture um, as an option for their facilities moving forward. I think that the, the norm will be kind of like how Colin Spencer and the Next Leaf crew are doing where they're doing in-house tissue culture for the sake of being able to make sure that any plants that come into their facility are under their control 100%. Obviously, we like growing from seed, but the problem with seed is that you have phenotypical expression that is going to vary from plant to plant to plant. And, and that's where it becomes a challenge because once you find that cultivar that works for you, you want that same product. You want that same product every single time. But how many times have we went to the dispensary, purchased a product, took that product home, used it, we're like, man, that was wonderful. That was absolutely great. And then the next time you use it, ugh, you know, it was absolutely boring. So it didn't smoke well, you know, it, it didn't taste very good. It wasn't something that, that you wanted. So anyways, this is a, another little small growth that um that we helped to set up this was a budget grow this was an operation that literally had the bare minimum to do uh, what they needed to do uh, but at the same time we tried to give them the best opportunity to be able to be successful given their environment um i think that all of us that have grown um, with leds over you know probably the last 10 years um, have definitely gone through the transition of using the, the crappy ones to uh, using some of the high-tech ones. So shout out to uh, the ones <laughs> that are still using the blurple ones because there are people out there that use them. Um, definitely not me, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> it, it, it is. So this isn't my stuff. This is just grows that we are in that we help people with. So... These are all, we don't have before and after pictures. I just wanted to show you guys just the, the variations that you have. You know, the things that are right about this room is the fact that the material that's on the walls here and here is also on the ceiling. So you have a piece 
of Unistrut that everything hangs off of. And then you have your fans, uh, your air conditioner right here, and, and a big fan. So, you know, besides the fact that they have nothing um, but to hand water and then to drain these uh, little drainage pans, it's like they're pretty much off to the races at this point. But, yes, they definitely need to adjust the height of their LEDs. Yes, yeah, on a day it's also good for – oh, sorry. So this is uh, – that in the, the other spectrum of that. And then this was their, their little tiny bedroom. So, you know, this is just a great example of that. Everybody's got to start somewhere. Um, everyone has to crawl before they walk and they have to walk before they run. So don't be frustrated whenever you see all of these big fancy operations. Um, just know that most of them did exactly what I did and exactly what most of you have done, where you grew in your, your basement, you grew in your attic, you grew in your garage, you grew in your closet. But at the same time, when you grow in a place like your basement, um, what you're smelling is VOCs. Whenever you go into a dusty, musky, moldy type basement, which uh, especially with older houses, um, that is literally VOCs off gassing and creating that smell. So um, whenever you go to a grandma's house and they kind of have that mothball smell, that's more of a, a moldy smell. That's, that's what that smell is and <laughs> happens more with older homes. What's your thoughts on times? What's your thoughts? So when it comes to LEDs, um, I'm someone that is always going to be chasing vapor pressure deficit. Um, so just, to, you know, I always reference everybody to that chart and it's going to be contingent upon what type of environmental controls that you have, because there's not a one perfect temperature nor a perfect humidity if you're able to uh, have both of those in there. So I definitely refer to the vapor pressure deficit thing. There's a lot of great charts. If you automate some of your stuff, um, if you have a system that is like uh, an Agron or an, I'm sorry, an Agron, what an Argus, I'm sorry, Argus <laughs> or a grow link or some type of an irrigation system that you know, most of this data is collected for you and it kind of puts you into a, uh, a cruise control type situation. I mean, some of the technology literally allows you to kind of have an autonomous car, but to have an autonomous grow. Uh, that's how uh, some of the, the other grow pictures that we show you earlier, uh, that's how they're actually surviving. So anyways, this is a picture of real cannabis with no filter. So I, I know that we don't get to see that very often with Instagram. So I just figured that I would show you. This is just a random grow that uh, we did like in our garage with no environmental controls. I had no CO2. Uh, I don't even think I had an air conditioner. I literally probably had this thing at probably... 88 degrees with 65% humidity the whole way through, um, you know, not by any means a, uh, a beautiful run, but at the same time, this is the reality of where most people are whenever they grow at home. You know, this is the stuff that you're super proud of, but at the same time, you know, would I be proud of this in a commercial setting? Hell no. You know, this is not that three pounds of light that, that we're wanting. This is what happens when you are at like a pound of light. Um, it's, it's something that we all have to understand that, you know, when it comes to things like Instagram and stuff like that, the ones that are showing the whole process, you know, the ones that are fully transparent that are saying, hey, you know, this is day one of my operation. This is day two. This is what happens when we forgot to, uh, you know, implement an IPM protocol and we got spider mites or we got fungus gnats or we got aphids or if you're growing outdoors, you got caterpillars. I mean, these are things that are universally challenging across the board. Um, this right here. Uh, another operation. This is actually that grow that we were talking about that I was talking about earlier that had the fungus gnat issue. Um, this grow is the result of once we got all those plants back and healthy and were able to have a successful grow. Um, obviously, there's some spacing is not. There's some challenges <laughs> still with this room because of the spacing. 
But uh, that was not our choice. That, that was not our choice. This is a stereotypical problem within cannabis that if people don't have rolling racks that they want to be able to have where they have an aisle, nope, they have an aisle here. And then once they reach in, you can only usually get about two plants in whenever you're actually reaching in there without disturbing those buds. So now your second and third or possibly fifth. So your first, second plant there, and then your third and your fourth. And then if this thing had five or had six in it, you know, you can just imagine how much of a challenge it is to be able to reach those plants once you get more than an arm length in. Yeah, which we were like six, we were six plants deep in that one. So obviously, you know, from a yield standpoint, this looks great. Um, but at the same time, from a professional point of view, I look at this as a overstuffed room that has too many plants that it's extremely lucky that they didn't have powdery mildew or microclimate issues just because, um, you know, this thing is just a disaster. There's a lot of plants in here that uh, needed a lot more love, needed a lot more uh, defoliation. But at the same time, when it comes to removing um, leaves off of a plant, I think that safely at any given time, you can remove up to about 30% of the canopy of a plant without actually causing any damage to the plant. Um, usually if you take more than that at any given time, which you give it a couple of days to be able to heal itself up a week, um, you can usually, uh, you know, pull off more the, the very next week. It's where it's important to be able to walk up and down your aisles every single day and just to have involvement um, you know, having the right amount of staff where you can have people that are cleaning up your room. So you're not having to, uh, you know, hand water something like this and also having to, uh, clean stuff like this, because once you get this far into it, it's a challenge to be able to clean this thing up to, you know, making it pretty. So here's another picture of, of the room just from a different angle. Um, obviously you guys see, this is very common practice in Oklahoma and other states where people are using the mini splits. Um, mini splits are not very energy efficient, uh, but at the same time, I understand why people use them just because they're inexpensive. Um, this grow has other issues, obviously from the ceiling, they're just using standard plant hangers and eye hooks. Um, they're using that Panda paper on the walls and um, with this operation, this is just a metal building and that was a garage door that was just, uh, insulated around and kind of filled all the cracks to be able to keep bugs and stuff from coming in. So the sea of green or two. Yes. And then we'll see you. Yeah. So when it comes to, this isn't a very good picture, so I'm going to probably jump to the next one. But anyways, <laughs> th this was just showing some of the bud production that we got. So this was a broom that produced, oh my gosh, we're close to that three pound mark. So, um, you know, this is what one of those three pound rooms look like, but at the same time, that was still not, uh, not very pretty. So what was the question? There's one about staffing and then there's one about the seat. Okay. So let's get into staffing. <laughs> so back to what I was saying earlier, when it comes to staffing, the, the, the first thing that you should do is again, is hire that integrated pest management tech. That person needs to be in charge of procurement, selecting what type of uh, pesticides are going to be used. If you're going to use something that's a little bit more aggressive, if you're out in a rural area and you have, you know, bigger creatures that are potentially trying to come into your facility, obviously keeping your grass mode, um, you know, trying to mitigate any organic material from being on the ground, um, if you are going to uh, mow, you want to be able to, you know, use something that collects those grass clippings so you're not creating any environments for bugs to be able to proliferate. Also, having um, bugs that feed on other bugs and what I was talking about earlier by taking organic material, piling it all up and then attracting, you know, different animals and stuff of that nature or bees, snakes, other things. I mean, things attract other things is what it all boils down to. So extremely important to make sure that that 
integrated pest management person is buying all of the pesticides, they're applying everything, and then it starts from the, the inside of the building and it works its way out. And the reason why you want to start from the very dead center of the building and work your way out is because you want to be able to push those bugs out. You want to be able to build a perimeter that once you push them outside of the building, no one's ever going to touch the building as far as bugs. And then you have precautionary measures in place. So that way, when someone enters your building, first thing that they do is they go through an air tunnel. It blows off any type of debris, bugs, pollen that they could have potentially brought in. After that, you need to step on something. Uh, they have pads that you can put like Sanidate or Zero Tall. Um, also, they have these light things that essentially it's like a shoe thing that you would have at TSA um, that kills bacteria and pathogens on the soles of your feet. So I recommend having something like that. Then after that, going into an area where your staff can change over to their uniform or what outfit that they're going to wear. Obviously, um, your hair is another big problem. So wearing a, a hat or wearing a, a hairnet. I know that hairnets are something that none of us like wearing. But at the same time, no one likes getting a bud that has a hair in it. Um, I think for the ones that have been in the black market have had all kinds of random things from rocks to hair um, and things that I don't even want to discuss. But anyways, nobody wants that any type of uh, commercial production product. So beard guards, hair nets, the whole nine yards, wearing gloves, wearing stuff, short sleeves. You definitely don't want to do. Um, especially if you're harvesting plants. Um, I know that with myself, I have some allergy issues. So every time I harvest a room, if I don't have my arms completely covered, I will be absolutely broken out in hives from the trichomes, which is nothing more than the plants, you know, protective material and trying to defend itself against, you know, heat and other pathogens, uh, other bugs and other things of that nature. So obviously the defense response from the plant itself. Oh, skip to the next one. I don't know how well, to we'll just it. go to the next slide. Sorry about that. <laughs> Anyways, this is the, the final product that came out of the, the room. Um, as you can see, um, I'm not somebody that takes very good pictures. Everything that I use has no filters. Um, <laughs> I stopped using any type of flash, so I'm just using my, my Galaxy and, and taking pictures. That's why my, my Instagram isn't as, as cool and as hip as a lot of other people's because I keep it real. Um, when it comes to that, but obviously this is um, your stereotypical dispensary grade product, passed for all the microbials. Um, yep, superhero profession shirts. Yep. 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 So this was the other um, part of this operation. So this is um, what the other building looked like whenever we first started. So a bunch of challenges that they had to go through. Um, besides that, Trish and I have written um, SOPs for different retail locations. Um, this thing right here was designed extremely well. It was just picked for a really terrible location. Um, didn't it would have been great if it was rec here. I'll just throw that out there. But since we are medical, I th it was just... Yeah, so obviously when it comes to determining where you stick your retail location, obviously you want to have a a high area um, of traffic that's coming through your, you know, your space. Besides that, you also want to have a lot of people that live around your space. I know that sometimes apartment complex are good um, or some type of a subdivision where it's convenient for somebody to stop by. When someone has to go out of their way to be able to go to a dispensary, either you have to have rock bottom prices or you have to, uh, you know, have something that's truly special. Um, this dispensary actually went out of business for not following the SOPs that we wrote um, for them. Um, wanted to have a bunch of things that were not conducive to the language. Um, this is a prime example of what happens when a business owner does not know the governing law and the, the rules that are governing the industry. Um, this is someone just saying, hey, I want to jump in the facility. I want to have this. I want to have that. Um, which there's a lot of things that are done correctly with this. 
um, we're able to really keep a directional flow where when somebody walks into the building, we control this first gate, then they enter into the building, they check in with the receptionist that's over here, then they get back into the product room, and then they come out this door, and then you can see right there. So that way, you're not having people bump into each other. Um, and also, you have the discretionary aspect, because some people, especially in your conservative states like Oklahoma, that some people are afraid to go to some dispensaries because they don't want their church members to see them, or they don't want the people that they work with to know what they're doing. Um, so with, with that being said, it's extremely important to be able to design everything with purpose, um, and to do things that are going to be do conducive to long-term growth of your facility. So that way, once federal legalization happens or rescheduling or removal of cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act, it allows all of us to be able to still survive. Um, again, I think that there is definitely a tremendous difference between people that are growing um, for patients um, and people that are growing for commercial use. Um, in a recreational market, I think that um, you should probably be a little bit more relaxed in regards to the regulatory body. But on the medical side, we have to keep in mind that some of the people that are using product are literally dying. Um, so when it comes to that, you know, I have no problem having full transparency within the operations that I'm at because I want people to do stuff better than me. I want to be able to walk into a facility and say, wow, this is really impressive. They're doing everything correctly. And I know that, you know, that's the great thing about cannabis is that it's very subjective that, you know, the best cannabis that you have is what you're currently smoking or what you're currently not smoking. Um, I think that we all kind of romanticize cannabis, but at the same time, you know, how much cannabis has been lost to prohibition. Um, I think that the future is definitely bright for cannabis, but at the same time, um, we need more people within the cannabis community to start running for political positions and start getting in a position where you can actually start controlling the legislative body when it comes to cannabis. Because if someone within the cannabis community that has ethics does it, then the cannabis community will be protected. If it's, you know, Wall Street or the people coming in that are just trying to make a buck, they don't really care about the patient. They don't care about the end consumer. They care about their bottom line. And, and again, just like I said at the very beginning of all this, that it all boils down to having intent um, and, and what you're trying to do with it. I know that there's a lot of companies out there that do things extremely well. There's a lot of companies that do things extremely poorly. But until we have a standardization across the board, when it comes to laboratory testing, um, the fact of the matter is that since that is a monetized business, it's automatically incentivized to be able to adulterate your numbers and your test uh, results to be able to make a product look better for the sake of being able to sell. Um, I think that for most dispensaries that if someone walked in and they saw something that looked pretty and it said 41% THC A on it, they're going to look at it. They're absolutely going to look at it. Now, whether or not that, that turns out to be a good experience um, is neither here nor there. But the fact of the matter is, if that's the first product that they're looking at, um, it, it is scary because the most educated person in the supply chain is the last person that the end consumer actually gets to meet. Um, the most important person in the supply chain is also the least educated person, and that's usually the bud tender. Um, anybody that goes into, do you want to switch it back to the thing? That goes into an operation and doesn't help to educate that patient as to why they're in there. Um, regardless, you know, and being able to classify something as medical versus recreational is, is very loose in, in my mind because for example, if you're using something for stress relief or depression, 
well, what happens when you go to a party? You are stressed out because there's a bunch of people that you don't know. So you use, um, you know, some people call that social use. But for me, that's using for medical purposes. It's kind of like the same excuse people give with alcohol and they call it liquid courage. Um, it's an icebreaker, something that is the extension of an olive branch or something that, you know, we have in common with each other is that we like the plant. We understand that the plant is extremely beautiful and possesses so many things that we have yet to even tap into that we need to breed plants with more diversity. We need to get out of the simple fact that 25 to 30 cultivars make up almost entire U.S. cannabis that when it comes to land race strains or supposed land race strains, that that's kind of a, a different argument because what I consider to be a land race strain is going to a remote area of the world that has very low inhabitants and you have natural growing cannabis, you get the intersex plants, you get the males, you get the females, you get everything good, bad, funky, all growing together and it's open pollinating. But the thing is that once you go to one of those areas and you say, hey, I'm going to pick this particular cultivar and I want to take these seeds and I want to, you know, cross this to, you know, my chem dog back home, then you've just created a cultivated variety. So, you know, by that, I don't consider that to be a land race, but I also understand that, you know, when people do talk about land races, they talk about your cultivars like Durban Poison, Malawi, your Acapulco Gold, Thai, stuff of that nature. Um, you know, I'm at an age where I remember when cannabis was contingent upon what time of the year it was. Um, cannabis would come from um the opposite of our winners whenever it was coming from the southern hemisphere and, and vice versa and you can actually see a lot of diversity within cannabis now whenever i go into grows whenever i go into retail locations i see very very homogenized cannabis that's <clears> how <throat> that has different names but still looks and, and tastes the same and i know you know that right now if something doesn't have a little bit of color to it you know if it's not over 20 percent thc then uh it's not considered quality but i have stuff um that i source whenever i had graduated from culinary school uh, when i worked in jamaica um that probably tests in the the low teens but the turp percentages are almost six that's like five and a half five and a quarter percent um and that will absolutely knock you on your rear but when it comes to testing most people are like mm, i don't want to grow this because it doesn't meet the criteria of what you know the, the public considers quality so i think that uh as we go on within the cannabis community i like to see breeders um, like khalifa genetics uh, people like Miles from Weed Should Taste Good, people, and I'm just naming out random ones that are coming to Can my you head. show your shirt? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Miles. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, those are guys that, that breed with intent. They breed with purpose. They breed for the longevity of the industry, and they're truly trying to make a difference at, at their level. Um, you know, I'm just trying to help all of my friends to, to realize that, you know, once this thing does break out and we have the ability to start exporting cannabis, that for me, that's the way to bring back all manufacturing jobs to the United States. Um, for me, there's more value in the textiles aspect of cannabis and industrial hemp than the medical applications with, with using the product. Um, what's the, the number one product that humans use? And, and that's going to be concrete. Uh, the fact that we can make concrete with hemp, um, you know, that, that's a no brainer. The fact that we can make insulation with hemp, that's a no brainer. It's a super food. I mean, you know, the same things that you guys know that have been said over and over again on here. Um, but someone has to do it. You know, I'm surprised no one's taking and making OSB at a, a grand level and that none of these operations that are growing vast amounts. Um, I know Sherbinsky is operating up in the, the northeast um, corridor of I-44 right there at the Missouri-Kansas border. And he's using a, uh, a prop plane to be able to, uh, 
you know, implement some of his foliar sprays. So obviously he's going to have a tremendous amount of biomass. So it's uh, definitely an interesting time to be in cannabis. But at the same time, what are people doing with some of these things that were stereotypical trash? Um, figuring out a way to be able to take those stems and say, hey, I can turn it into something else and make a profit with. Um, the same way that people used to go about taking, um, you know, their trim material. I mean, how many decades did people throw that stuff away? Um, you know, I also come from an era where, you know, I open blasted with even PVC, which, you know, I hate to admit that I was that guy, but, you know, I didn't know any better because, you know, the, I wasn't reading forums. I just knew that, you know, I can create this one thing and that if I, I whipped it, but now obviously the, the concentrates that we're able to make is obviously a different topic for another day. Um, but that's something that we're extremely knowledgeable in regards to as well. But the problem is that it all boils down to shit in, shit out. Um, if you have product that is not something that you're super proud of, that's the product that needs to go to distillation. That's the product that needs to go to edibles. Um, when you have subpar material, you know, don't ruin your brand because you have one opportunity to be able to release product and, and to have that first impression. Um, I know that this year we bought all of the, uh, the flower packs for Oklahoma's Cannabis Cup and our list of the ones that we thought were poor versus the ones that we thought were actually good that we would buy again. I think we have like three or four in the good pile and the rest are in the bad pile. Um, and I would say, I hope this particular company wins this year. Another shout out to F5 Farms. I don't know these guys at all. Um, the name of this cultivar is Tropic Runts. Um, I don't know if you guys can see a good picture of this bud, but I'm going to shake here. But as you can see, this thing is as pretty as it gets. Um, Terps are extremely loud, extremely pungent. I mean, like... I, the bud looks really good. Bud structure is yeah. great, but guess what? It only tests at 18% THC. So is, is that <laughs> is that considered quality by Oklahoma standards? Um, you know, I would like to say yes. So um, I hope they're the ones that, that win it all this year. I think that they had a good representation on their sativa dominant, their indica dominant, and also their hybrid. Um, I know that their sativa dominant was tropical runs. That thing really stood out to me. Um, I'm very much old fashioned with my, my cultivars. I like having the um, ability to pick which continent that I'm actually smoking my cultivars from. Um, I know that even going to places like Jamaica, um, it was extremely difficult to be able to find cultivars that weren't influenced by Dutch or U.S. breeders back in 2001. So obviously it's getting more and more difficult to uh, figure those things out <clears throat> and to be able to find those areas because as the, as the normalcy of cannabis continues to happen and once the U.S. changes its drug laws and the rest of the world says, hey, you know, we can make money doing this too, that it's going to be um, an arms race for cannabis genetics. Universities are already starting to do it now that the hemp bill has opened up and universities can start sourcing genetics on the hemp side because... You know, how are most cannabis seeds uh, sold now? They're actually sold as a souvenir and they are usually uh, labeled hemp on them as well. So you're starting to see a tremendous arms race and everybody preparing for interstate commerce. So, you know, I'm not trying to be the, the bearer of bad news, but at the same time, I just think that everyone needs to be openly discussing you know, how do we survive when this happens? Because, you know, some people say the end of the Biden administration, you know, some people say that if Trump would have been reelected, that it would have happened. And I'm looking at it in comparison to alcohol prohibition that we had less states that legalized alcohol before they repealed alcohol prohibition. So we're at that turning point. I think that if we didn't have stuff like COVID, uh, didn't have stuff like Afghanistan going on currently, that Potentially, you know, Chuck Schumer's uh, language would have a little bit more traction, but as of right now, it is what it is. Are you sure? <laughs> what? 
and brown scarf. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my eyebrow scar. So, um, the, these no. are these are hard questions from uh, <laughs> the audience. So, I actually um, came from the black market, and in the black market, you uh, have certain things that you have to abide by, or uh, there's consequences for your actions. And uh, <laughs> I didn't act right at, at one point, so. Um, I uh, probably deserved it. Uh, I disagree. <laughs> did, 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 Trish, did, did Trish do that to you? <laughs> no, but she's she's done uh, better things to me <laughs> that have caused significant damage to me, though. But, anyways, um, I guess I'll take some uh, some questions from you guys. I, I, and by the way, I love Trish. I love that you've been in the chat. Uh, I didn't give you guys a preface that sometimes the chat is uh, unkind, but uh, it's, been, <laughs> it's been a gentle, a gentle chat today. Uh, can you talk about Jamaica and kind of what, what years were you living there and kind of what did you see locally? I mean, you had mentioned that Dutch genetics had kind of invaded, but like, what do you see in the local market? Yeah, so in Jamaica, um, I was there roughly for nine months in 2001. Um, while I was there, I worked for the Sandals in Ochos Rios and Montego Bay. Um, just a little bit more about my, my history. Um, I used to cook hibachi and do sushi. That's what I did for my nine to five job while I was in college and what I did afterwards. Um, I made the mistake of after graduating from culinary school, getting back into the same type of cuisine that um, I had started off in. So when it came down to trying to get that raise that I didn't, you know, do anything essentially that I wasn't already doing. So they're like, well, there's answer to your raise. So I decided to, to go to another country and work at one of the all inclusive resorts. So I was that uh, circus monkey type uh, guy that was taking the little egg and catching it on my spatula and throwing shrimp into people's mouths, um, which is fun, you know, absolutely fun. But I kind of looked at myself as a glorified circus monkey because I was essentially doing tricks for money. <laughs> well, so, were you part of the Benny Hanna chain? <laughs> Benny Hanna's is actually where I learned how to uh, to cook hibachi. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, good times and bad times. I think that the best transition that I have seen in cannabis um, has been people from the restaurant industry. I know that James Loud is from the the restaurant industry. I think that I found that a lot of people um, that have worked in restaurants, have the ability to be able to multitask and take on some of the uh, the hardships of working in the cannabis scene. So that's the, the best that I have personally seen out of most industries. Um, but Jamaica was very, very unique. I was making American money, um, but living in a third world country, everything there is negotiable um, at the time. So there, there was things that I was obviously doing that I wasn't proud of. Um, as far as the cannabis community, you always have to refuse whatever they first offer you. So as soon as you get to the airport in Montego Bay, like you haven't even gone through customs yet. There's people trying to sell you cannabis. I mean, I, the first time that I was there on vacation, um, I bought cannabis in the bathroom uh, from some random guy. And <clears throat> anyways, the, the first time that I was there, um, we were staying in the, the nicest resorts at the time, which is probably not what I should have chose because everyone else that was going to the resort was like 50 and older. And I was 21 at the time. So like really not the, the age group of the people we were wanting to hang out with. But sometimes I find those older people are uh, a lot more brutally honest. So they uh, tend to... Uh, to be a little bit more fun, especially when you're interacting with strangers. But the ride to the resort uh, was roughly two and a half, three hours. Uh, during that time frame, <laughs> the shuttle bus driver pulled over three times. Um, keep in mind for the ones that have been to Jamaica, just imagine the worst dirt road that you have ever been on or one way road, um, windy curvies, like driving up uh, you know, in the mountains of, uh, the Emerald Triangle, 
that you know you could potentially fall off the road to your death and there's also livestock tied to trees that are hanging out in the middle of the road so you have to like dodge livestock you have to dodge you know uh rock slides rocks falling down just anything that could potentially be thrown at you just because again limited infrastructure um when <laughs> we got to the first house the bus driver got off ran into the there came back out and he literally just hold up a big bag of flour uh, it was probably about an ounce in there and they paid him ten dollars um then about 30 minutes later um someone went up to the the driver whispered in his ear and then he pulled over about five minutes later and um we all stopped to use the restroom and then um got back in our vehicle and then he went right across the street afterwards and uh bought this guy that was probably 60 years old uh I, I don't know probably a half ounce of cocaine i mean enough that it was a, a noticeable amount um g gave that to him and then i'm thinking whoa what, what have we gotten ourselves into and then when we get to the third place um literally run in and just grab some hash so you know i'm thinking man did i talk to the wrong person whenever i was at the airport so soon as we got to checking all of our luggage, the first person that was there <clears throat> checked us in, said, hey, you know, you're going to be room, blah, 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 blah. Then they had their porter that took our luggage to our room. As soon as we got to the room, that person goes, hey, do you need anything? And I'm like, well, I think we got all of our luggage. She's like, no, do you need anything? It kind of winked at me. And I was like, oh, well, what, what do you have? And uh he went and got us some flour and whenever he came back i was like mm, no i don't think so because you know i had bought like a high times from back then and you know something on like jamaica and like where to go at and things to do so once uh we had the ability to look at that <clears throat> we uh had him go off and he was gone for a couple hours and then came back and when he came back he had something that was significantly better um, so I was like, okay, I'll buy this. I think I spent $20 for an ounce. And then we went and started doing our things. Um, the next day, uh, that was kind of later on in the evening. The next day, <clears throat> we went to the bartender. And, you know, just like any other place in the world, that usually bartenders and taxi cab drivers are the ones that have the hookup on most substances. So we started talking to him about getting some hashish. Um, you know, at, at the time, I, I was still really, um, I guess, green under the gills in regards to my, my hash consumption. So um, I had seen people smoke hash, but I was just primarily a flower person. And whenever I got this piece of hash, I paid $20 for it also, and it was probably close to an ounce, um, which I was like, man, this is a great deal, but I didn't have anything to smoke it out of. So... What did I do? I you know I tried to break it up into chunks and I had bought a couple of packs of king size zigzags. And once I uh, started breaking this thing up, I literally tried to roll a joint of just hash, which if you've ever tried to do that, it's, uh, you know, you, you hit it, it burns the paper and then the hash falls out. <laughs> so you actually don't get to take very many hits of it. Um, and keep in mind that yes, there, there was the internet at this point, but you know, in 2001, you know, your resorts and stuff like they had kind of a uh, a little internet cafe. You didn't have access in your room. There was no Wi-Fi in your room and stuff like that yet. So you're limited on accessibility to those things. So I didn't have you know anything to be able to figure out how to smoke it. So obviously, you know, just uh, went down to the restaurant ended up um, finding a, uh, a tiki torch and stealing that thing and putting it on the back porch and doing uh, knifers over uh, a flame. So <laughs> that's not something that works very well, nor do I recommend it. Um, but it took me a long time um, after that vacation. Next time I came back, it took me a long time to be able to really develop the relationships with the locals. Um, while we were on vacation, we paid um, actually the bartender to escort us around the island because they have all these little excursion type things where you pay $100 and you can go to places like Dunn's River Falls, which is like a natural water park that's super duper pretty. 
Um, but at the very end of the place, they walk you through a straw market. And for the ones of our listeners that have ever been to a third world country, it is extremely challenging to go through some of these straw markets because everybody wants to sell you something that they buy probably at the dollar store. I think that uh, in Jamaica, they probably go to the equivalency of a dollar store or whatever their Walmart is, and they all buy the same trinkets and sell them in their own little uh, things because you have all these things that look like they're made by hand, but it's also not something that uh, is made by hand. It's definitely uh, pretty run-of-the-mill things. But a lot of times what those people will do is they'll be like, hey, pretty lady, what's your name? And then you'll be like, oh, her name's Trish. And then they'll carve her name on that thing, and then they'll be like, $5. Well, I didn't tell you to carve her name on that. Now you just have something that's got you know some random person's name on it. How are you going to sell that? And you know they'll sit there, and they will – banter you and they'll follow you through and eventually just to get rid of them you're just like man here's five dollars just leave me alone but i mean it's just it was uncomfortable um you know and that's just things that you have to deal with in, in other countries so there's pros and cons to everywhere that you go and we take for granted in the u.s but um having a chance to work in cannabis in and outside of the united states because i've also had a chance to work um in some of the european countries <laughs> And with, with that being said, that you see more of the bad practices and the things that are kind of uh, figuring out just from trial and error type thing. And most of the Jamaican cultivars have been already in 2001, were already influenced by um, Dutch and U.S. genetics. Everything had White Widow in it at that point. I was seeing um, some Super Silver diesel. Um, I know that I really try to hunt down lamb's bread. Um, I was able to find it, but I was also able to find a cultivar um, that I had talked to you, Peter, about in the past, um, whenever we were talking about finding testers, um, that is crossed with the father of um, the lamb's bread. So that's a extremely rare cultivar to be able to obtain. So pretty proud to be able to have that. But I also, Sanctuary. yeah, so, you know, I, I'm fortunate enough that through doing the things that I've done and then having family um, back in Hawaii, Trish is originally from the island of Saipan, which is, is in the same island chain that Guam's located in within the Northern Marianas Islands, which, I mean, you can do another episode on her. She's actually more of the the tech brains and the, the one that makes me really look good. Um, I couldn't even went through those slides if I was just trying to pull stuff randomly out of my phone. Yeah, so. I think we need more Trish. Trish, uh, Trish, you seem like Penny to Chase's Inspector Gadget. I want to be like Willy Wonka where you don't know who I am until I want you to know who I am. <laughs> so, but anyways, um, in Jamaica, you see a lot of locals that will have smaller grows where you'll have a plot of land that will be um, anywhere from like a 30 by 30 plot of land um, all the way up to an acre. It's usually more like your Orange Hill area um, that you start to see, you know, people that are growing more in the mountains, areas that are a little bit more challenging to get to geographically tend to be the areas where you find the the untouched stuff so the areas that are really touristy in jamaica like if you go to the bob marley area and try to buy cannabis from that area you're going to get you know not the real true representation of jamaican product and i think that that holds pretty much true to everything in life that it's not necessarily what you know it's who you know um most of the time when it comes to quality products and i know that you know people don't want to ever admit to smoking mids but i assure you if you are you know over the age of probably 35 that you have definitely probably my entire youth mids. so and, and you know that that's the reality of it and i i know that it's neat to see all kinds of things on Instagram and I always kind of refer back to, to what's going on, but I also kind of laugh at it because I'm like, man, like that, that's not the reality of what goes on. And the ones that do um, 
things properly um, are usually the ones without voices. Um, so I'm glad that this channel is actually starting to, uh, you know, get people that aren't stereotypical, um, your, your big names, like your standard um, Jungle Boys and, and Burner, where, you know, they have a lot of recognition. But at the same time, you know, I look at it, stuff like that, that Girl Scout cookies is what OG Kush crossed with Durban Poison and then maybe something else crossed into it afterwards. So, I mean, what's how really unique is that? But I mean, it's also been marketed extremely well. I'm not trying to take anything away from, you know, what was done. Um, because obviously it, it's a tremendous business that has a lot of traction and it's got a lot of support and everybody knows about it. But at the same time, how many people, um, you know, have crossed Durban Poison and OG Kush at some capacity or another? Um, so I, I think that there's something that's definitely been lost to prohibition. Um <clears throat> I know that Kevin Georgery is trying to define that skunk line. I know that that cat piss um, episode was extremely, um, I guess, uh, entertaining from the chat side. But, you know, mo moving forward, that breeding with purpose and breeding with intent on the diversity side and using some of these cultivars that people from the States have never seen is going to be able to, to really show people what we had and some of those brick weed um, and those bricks that people smoked from, they were extremely loud. Granted, it looked like shit and it had seeds in it, but by it the way, was... can you see that picture? Yeah, oh, yeah. I giggled earlier. <laughs> so, and, and for me, the the first time that I ever saw brick weed is whenever I moved to the states. Um, I think that that time frame in between, like middle school to high school, when most people start, you know using cannabis. Um, I had started a little bit before that, not anything to brag about. I wish I would have waited until I was 25 just for brain development, but didn't know that information and in, in any of those studies at that time. Um, but what I saw for cannabis, the first time I saw it, I was like, that's what I have on the bottom of my lawnmower. That's not weed. And uh, they're like, nope, smoke this. And, you know, I smoked. I was like, well, that's 100% that's weed, but that's not weed that I've ever seen before. And uh, that's what started me on the process of growing cannabis um, through the black market side. And obviously, you know, now that I've been operating on the legal side of cannabis for the last 10 years, we don't have to, you know, have that involvement. I don't have that statue of limitation to worry about. And I can talk about some of the things that we're doing. So um, as of right now, Trish and I are building a new business that is going to be geared for operating in Oklahoma in the short term. I don't want to give too much information um, with it, but ultimately we want to operate in the short term, but we also want to be able to structure ourselves to be able to operate once federal legalization happens and not be just a standard production facility. Um, I think the ones that are only focusing on production need to really start taking some uh, long hard thoughts on what it's going to look like for them as a business once they have businesses that are competing and that can throw you know five hundred dollar pounds or you know a dollar or a gram uh, pounds at the market until they eliminate all of the the smaller ma and pa operations and then come back in and then restructure cannabis and then charge whatever they want to um, and we can use the um, the pharmaceutical business model. Um, when a pharmaceutical product is, is made or a pharmaceutical company is starting up, they have two options. One is to make generic drugs and to start making a profit off those generic drugs. Or two, they can start on the R&D side and they can start development of a drug that is for whatever ailment that they're trying to go after. Um, but the whole thing is that most businesses don't want to allocate money to R&D. That's something that's extremely important um, in all aspects of industry, but something that is really not looked upon very highly within the cannabis space. Um, you know, for, for you uh, listeners that have been in a commercial facility and, and the times that you guys have a chance to be able to tour facilities, how many times do they have an allocated area 
for stress testing of their plants, just to be able to grow them under the worst horrific conditions. So that way, if they're breeding or they're selling clones um, as like a nursery business model, that someone has the ability to be able to say, hey, under these conditions, they'll still perform this way. Um, versus saying, hey, you just got to figure it out and you have to kind of shoot from the hip. Um, you know, that's the difference between operations succeeding and being profitable and also failing is having a run of something that has intersex issues or something that is really not up to par with what um, needs to be ran. Um, I'm somebody that is very much a purist. Um, I, I definitely respect what you do, Alex. Um, you know, that's the same as what Trish and I do. Um, but at the same time, since I don't like social media, but I understand the importance of it because I look at it as it's a tremendous killer of productivity. Um, and, you know, good or bad, obviously it's a good way to be able to hit the masses and to be able to talk to 162 people all at once where, you know, luck, most of the time I'm lucky to talk to five to 10 people at once. So um, you can cover a, a larger demographic, but at the same time, uh, it's like-minded individuals. So um, it's great to be around people that, you know, have the desire to be able to operate in this space, want to do the things that they want to do. And ultimately, you know, those are the ones that should be in the cannabis space that have paid their dues versus the ones that are just waited until, it, you know, it was legal. And now they're just going to dump a lot of, you know, money into it because they have, you know, big money backing. Um, that's the reason why I don't personally run, um, feminized gear is for the simple fact that it takes me literally years to be able to work through a cultivar, to be able to stabilize something where I can release it to someone and say, Hey, it's going to produce this way. Granted it's by the way, to Chase, I totally forgot. You have a bulldog, right? Oh, can you hear her snoring? <laughs> Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. All right, we'll, we'll get rid of her. Can, can, no, 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 don't, no, 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 don't. I love it. Uh, can, can you show her? Can you can you hold the? Do you have like a? Yeah, hold that up and and give us a oh, shot of the. She jumped up real quick. Uh, okay. She, I swear she knows. Yeah. She knows. <laughs> All right. Ca carry on. <laughs> English Bulldogs are a, a very uh, unique breed because they don't bark, but they grunt, snort, fart, and um, but they have so much character. Um, actually, we can show a really neat trick that she does. Here, can you hold this? I don't know if she's going to do it. She'll do it for me. She'll Just do it for you. <laughs> watch. You got it? I got it. She's Bang. Like, she's looking right at me. That was amazing. Yay! <laughs> Hold on, I got a rubber now. Yay! That, that was for uh, dramatic effect, her dying slowly. But yeah, she has aspirations of being a uh, an actress. <laughs> but, you know, ultimately, though, that with more and more time that goes by, the, the more that best practices and really setting your facility up where you have everything that you can do um, to be able to control the quality of the product all the way through the channels. Um, obviously, some states you don't have the ability to be vertically integrated. Um, that poses its own challenge because I think that at that point, how do you take biomass from, you know, the panhandle of Oklahoma and then get it to Tulsa within a couple of hours of it being frozen, trying to make um, frozen biomass to be able to make ice water hash rosin um, without having nitrogen? It's extremely challenging to be able to do that. So most of the people look at it from the standpoint, well, if I can't do it right, then I'm just going to skip that. So definitely. What are your thoughts on danger? I don't know what Dempure is. What is Dempure? De De Dempure is Dragonfly Earth Medicine's kind of certification. So ha mm. how about just your thoughts on different kind of like organic certification programs and the future sure. of 
of at least because I feel like certifications are kind of a trade off of like you got to spend money, you got to have an admin person. Uh, so what I feel in regards to that is obviously, you know, at the commercial level, I think that there needs to be some type of a ranking system, kind of like when you Google a restaurant and it tells you if it is a cheap restaurant, if it is a really expensive restaurant where they have or a hotel where you have stars, um, because we don't currently have that in cannabis. Um, I think that that could be something as simple as saying, hey, that this operation meets this requirement. It does this. It does this. It does this. Um, so that way they can get different tiers. And this is why you would pay more for this particular product is because they go through more scrutiny than this product does. Um, I think that ways of doing that will definitely show that there's a difference because as of right now, um, Instagram is literally the difference between buying a Bugatti or buying a uh, a pento, um, you know, you, you really don't know. And I know that we have a lot of friends out in California still. And obviously I, I like to, to know what California is doing um, on the retail side, because obviously it, there's the trickle down effect. Um, Oklahoma is probably a, a year to two years behind as far as what is trendy and hip, everything from fashion to uh, genetics and cultivars that are popular. But ultimately, once I get a lot of those commercialized products and we sample and use them, I'm really not that much more impressed with the stuff that, that you know, we get given to us as gifts from people that are, are struggling to, uh, to make compliance or they're worried about metric because they didn't build their infrastructure with the infrastructure of doing that. And unfortunately, you know, that's the beauty and the tragedy of not having barriers to entry in a state like that, because you do have self cannibalization and you do have self regulatory of the industry. Um, but it's done by the consumers. Um, you know, there's some business models here that really try to sell product at the, the cheapest margins possible. Um, and they do extremely well. And then you have other businesses that have phenomenal product, but they're in a bad location or they are having to sell things at a higher price point because they're paying more for the quality, but just the general public doesn't know that. So, you know, for me, I think that it's important to, to look at as many different facilities as possible. I know that People think that I'm probably scouting out facilities, but whenever I go into dispensary and I, and I, granted, I don't buy dispensary flour very often, except for, for purpose. Um, either I'm doing quality control for a business or I'm trying to see the degradation of product over a certain amount of time. Like this dispensary bought a half pound of this product six months later, what are they doing to store it? You know, is it going to still represent the quality whenever they gave that to them, whenever it was freshly dried and cured, or is it going to resemble oxidation and goldening and the things that people um, attribute with it being a lower quality or, or mid grade? So that's another thing that's important is keeping relationships with your retail locations and saying, hey, you know, if I'm going to give you my product, um, how are you going to store it? You know, is it going to be in front of a window? Is it going to have light? Um, or is it going to be <clears throat> dumped into one big jar and it's going to, that jar is going to be open 50 to 100 times a day and it's just going to dry out. So that way, six months later, you get a customer that's never bought your brand and they're like, you know, I'm never going to buy from so-and-so because, you know, they just had some really dry, nasty funk. But reality was that that was probably some of the best flour that they could have ever used. Um, and that's the importance of people uh, packaging stuff like in California where um, everything's packaged individually. Sometimes they'll put a little bit of nitrogen in there. But the problem with that is once that seal has been popped, now it degrades extremely fast. So as long as you're using that small amount of product within a short amount of time, it's great. But at the same time, um, it's difficult to to store product over long terms whenever dispensaries don't have the infrastructure to be able to house that product. And it boils down to what type of you know retail location are you messing with? And that goes back to what I was saying, that it's better to be able to control those variables and say, you know what, I'm not going to count on, you know, 
emerald green dispensary or whatever the name of the dispensary is because I can just have my own dispensary. I can sell my product at better margins, obviously, than what I would have to sell it at wholesale. And I can control the quality. So that way I'm only stocking my shelves with the product that I need to be moving. And that way um, your inventory can be first in, first out. Um, you know, I, I think that the way that material is presented um, across the board is not necessarily a true representation of the product that you get. Most people cherry pick their product that they're sending in for lab testing. That's going to be um, the best that they think that they're going to get out of that particular cultivar. But then whenever you get that material, um, I've had this happen to me where I look at the little sample jar Hey, that looks good. It smells good. I think I want it. And then we'll look at each other and be like, okay, we're going to decide on this one. And then we buy it. And then we're like, what in the hell is that? It's not even the same thing. <laughs> like it's a completely different cultivar. Um, and th that's really disappointing. But at the same time, whose fault really was it? It's not necessarily the retail location because it could have been the farmer. It could have been the wholesaler. It could have been, you know, the, the logistical side, um, you know, the, there's a lot of things that variables. that are variables within cannabis. And, and that, again, goes back to the beauty of all of it, that it's so subjective that, you know, what works for me might not work for Trish, might not work for Peter, might not work the same way for Alex or Chad or any of the other um, community members that are, are on here. So let's see. It doesn't look like the Big Mac on TV. <laughs> Does it look like it doesn't look like absolutely it doesn't look like the Big Mac on TV. So that, that's that's a great uh, example. I'm actually probably going to steal that. Uh, <laughs> but but that's the reality of it, though. You know, we, we want stuff that's pretty. We want stuff that, that's sexy. But at the same time, you know, it's, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. So when it comes to cannabis, um, you know, I, I'm never going to dog what another person does. Um, as far as what they grow, because the connection that you have with that plant um, is your connection with that plant. Um, the time that you put in that plant, you know, is going to reflect as your, your final income or not income, but your final result. And that's important. But at the same time, if you don't have the, the infrastructure, thank you, to be able to set up a good drying and curing room, what was all that work for? You know, did you just put in you know, a hundred days potentially to be able to screw it up in a week because your drying room was 80 degrees. Um, Trish and I went to an outdoor farm that was literally acres and acres and acres here. And they were shucking plants and breaking them down in just a standard barn. Um, and it was 80 degrees outside, absolutely as hot as can be. Um, and by the time they got it into the back of the freezer, you know, we're a couple hours in at that point. And then by the time that actually froze, we're looking at eight to 10 hours. So it's like, and they're wondering why are the terpenes, you know, only testing at like, you know, 0.87 or under 2%. I'm like, well, you know, shit in, shit out. You know, you can't cut corners and expect to, uh, to make uh, stuff that's really impressive. And that's also the problem when it comes to processing is that, you know, now that you have technology like CRC, it's one thing to use CRC for refinement, to be able to say, hey, I wanna isolate this and I want to actually have something as pure as possible, but that's not what the technology is being used for. It's being used for people not knowing how to grow product or they don't have the right environmentals and they grow shit and they're still trying to make a million dollars and become a millionaire. Um, you know, we had a, uh, a group that uh, had a lot of traction in Oklahoma um, and their business model on the first day that Trish and I met them was to grow a lot of weed and make a lot of money. <laughs> so you tell me if that person deserves to be in the cannabis business with that's their literal business model. Um, I had to do everything in my power not to just laugh at them. Um, and, and then that person went on to tell me that he doesn't use cannabis and, um, you know, that was it Dan Bazarian was his role model. And, uh, we've met two people already like that. <laughs> and, and I understand that sex sells, but again, we're trying to market medicine here. Yeah. Um, what, what is it ignite? I mean, they, they used to show up 
at uh, event, I mean, pre-COVID at events in LA, and it'd be like the booth babes with big boobs and uh, bikinis, and that that was the whole image to the world. Well, you know, I guess that that's the stereotypical like uh, social media lifestyle. You know, the the larger than life. The you know, I, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. You know, I have you know my personal private jet. I have this yacht, which you know most of the people that I know that are really in cannabis, you know, that they they pay their bills and you know they might be able to have you know a few nice things, but most people are just trying to struggle to get by. And, you know, ultimately that's why it's important to learn those fundamentals. And once you have solid fundamentals that everything just gets easier once you understand the, the base things that need to really happen. And, and again, I can't, you know, emphasize more that regardless if you're going to be growing at your house, you know, do the same thing, you know, clean the area up that you're going to put your tent or you're going to put your plants and then start cleaning out from there and then putting a perimeter barrier, um, whatever that may be, and trying to have as many barriers between you and the outside. So that way, if a mosquito or, or not a mosquito, if a fungus gnat or something bad comes in that, you know, you have a bug light in that first entrance, you have some type of an air shower, you have something that, that keeps that bug from being able to come in. Because if you're in an area, just say that you're in the, the continental US, that most of us have four seasons here. Now, some don't, but most do. But with that being said, think about what a bug would be going after from a a comfort standpoint, you know, when it's 75, 80 degrees in a greenhouse during the winter time and it's zero degrees, 14 degrees, whatever it was this last winter, that bug is going to come straight for you. And you have to uh, really think about, you know, what you're wanting to do, whether or not you want to have a sterile environment, whether or not you want to have organics, because, you know, there's some medical patients that don't want to think about using beneficial insects um, just because they know that they're there. It, it's something that I don't really care about because, again, you know, I come from a time that I've seen all kinds of things in, in cannabis that, that shouldn't be there. Um, and... I just understand that I have long hair. I know that's the stuff that we grow at the house, you know, I'll get hair in it. I don't know if it's mine or if it's Trish's because we both have long black hair. Um, but at the same time, if it would be anybody else's hair, I'd be completely grossed out. So, you know, th those things are important. Um, after that, making sure again. So, that so just quickly at home, what do you guys like? What do you like? What What's your personal taste? What are you smoking on right now? So right now, this is actually, I, I say that I don't mess with feminized gear. This is a uh, girl crush from Mendocino. 2020 Mendocino. 2020 Mendocino. We did a grow off, show off with. Uh, or like a local hydroponics store, um, Organics OKC. And um, anyways, we I just bought them just to be able to um, just support, you know, what they were trying to do, kind of like a. Um, a little fundraiser type thing. Um, not something that I would keep, but I understand what they selected for. Um, I know that biscotti is in here. It is definitely biscotti leaning. Um, Trish and I like um, a lot of sativas, um, super silver, sour diesel. Haze is one of my favorite cultivars. Um, at the same time, it really depends on what it is that I, I'm going after. If it's during the day, I like using sativas, stuff that uh, kind of gets me a little bit peppy. Um, obviously, I don't have any problems talking to people, so um, that works well for me. It actually kind of calms me down a I, little bit. I love the big smile on Trisha's face when you said that. <laughs> and, and then uh, obviously at nighttime once we start to uh, settle down like we're starting to smoke indicas right now so that way we can uh, cook dinner after we're done with this and then you know go back to our thing so but when it comes to cultivars like i know that in our forever stable um as of right now um we have chem dog we have afghani we, super silver that he mentioned. we had the super silver. We have uh, 
the Exodus cheese cut. We have Cheezel. We have blueberry. We have DJ Short's blueberry. That's old as shit from the first time he released those things. It needs to go through tissue culture really badly. Really badly. <laughs> um, what else? We have uh, the super glue. We have. He does. He cooks. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I can't even. I want to say that we have around 25 like full time cultivars that we run. And then um, the, there's some other things that we've made that, that we have that we just run for production settings, um, which actually brings me to another point that when you are in the cannabis industry, most of us like to do business by being able to stick our hand out there and say, hey, if I say I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it. You know, whether it be something that I make money off of or it's something that I don't bid out correctly and it costs me money. Once I stick my hand out there and say, Hey, this is what I'm going to charge you, or this is what I'm going to do. That's my word. Obviously we do live in a time where, you know, the only time that you need contracts and attorneys is when something goes wrong. But at the same time, keep in mind that a lot of the people that came into the cannabis industry, um, didn't only sell cannabis. Now there was, was some that, you know, they only messed with cannabis, but there are other individuals that looked at it um, just like heroin or cocaine that they can make money off of all of it. So those weren't necessarily the best people. So some of the individuals still come in with that kind of mentality that, it, you know, it's a more of the hustle than trying to provide stuff to the masses and they'll cheat still, you know, do whatever they can out of the realm of what someone would consider ethical to be able to get ahead. Um, we've had multiple operations here that we have given our production cultivars because they didn't select uh, correctly and they weren't hitting their batch numbers in Oklahoma. Um, every time you grow out a cultivar, you have to hit 10 pounds. Once you get 10 pounds, you have to get a batch test and a compliance test for that. Um, and then if you grow 11 pounds, you would have to get two tests. If you grow only one pound, you still have to get that same one test. So obviously you want to try to max out that batch number and get as close to 10 pounds with whatever um, batch it is that you're, you're doing. So anyways, this, uh, this facility had like 25 different cultivars for <laughs> roughly uh, a 1200 square foot grow um, didn't even produce a pound um, per each cultivar and now they have to add a 250 to 300 dollar um, compliance test on that so now you know you have to add an additional say 300 dollars onto your price per pound well that's a lot of times your margin when you're selling at the wholesale level um, and if you're not growing something that's extremely nice, you're not going to get those premium prices, uh, for it. So, you know, I think that Oklahoma is definitely going to go towards a consignment business model, um, just because there's so many operators here and the retail locations can basically say, Hey, you know, I have 10 other farms that want to put product on my shelves, you know, I need something that's going to sell. And they'll say, Hey, I'll, I'll sell your product, but you got to put it on yourself. You have to take the chance of it degrading on my shelf and you have to worry about it oxidizing. So that way the retailer says, Hey, I'm going to put all the, um, the responsibility and all the risk back onto the grower, which, you know, the grower is, you know, fundamentally the person that screwed the most out of the whole supply chain, usually anyways. Um, so it's important that, you know, when commercial operations open up that less is better. Um, being able to find one cultivar for <clears throat> a thousand square foot room is usually the best way to go because you can dial that in. You can figure out how it's going to, you know, uptake water, how it's going to feed, how it likes light. Once that happens, now you can start actually bumping up your yields and you can start kind of shaving off time by doing this, that, and the other. Um, they call that crop steering, but you know, that's also data collecting at the same time, which data is the most valuable commodity for all of us moving forward. And 
you know, we don't even really realize how much information we give up just by agreeing to the terms and conditions of YouTube or Facebook or Instagram. I mean, you know, people talk about wanting privacy, but you give it all up <laughs> as soon as you join any type of social media stuff. That's the reason why whenever you talk about, say, the new PlayStation 5 and then you start getting ads for it randomly. But whenever you hit the, the microphone button on your phone and say, hey, uh, look up PlayStation 5 that it will pull up anything but what you actually say. Um, so how much is that microphone listening? And I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist, but it's the reality of what is actually going on um, with those things because just the people you know, the people Trish, you... Trish, is his conspiracy theory game strong? <laughs> I think both our games are pretty strong. <laughs> nah. Not, not anything crazy. I'm not a flat, I mean, flat not. earth person or anything like that, but um, we just believe in all science, you know, so we don't yeah. pick and choose what science we want to believe in. We look at it from the standpoint that as long as something is peer reviewed, as long as you have the ability to be able to take whatever is published and actually, you know, do the same tests and be able to end up with the same results, then you have to hold it as being true. Um, if you're not able to duplicate those same results, then obviously at that point you have the ability to be able to, you know, say why you didn't have those same results. But again, that's the importance of consistency and being able to produce something consistent that is going to be what's sought after by most patients. Um, Peter, for example, do you have a cultivar that, that you wish that you can get every single time, but you you can't because of the inconsistencies of how it's grown, where it's grown, or who's growing it? I'm kind of a variety kind of guy. So I like kind of trying different things. I mean, I like coming back to things, but I also like trying new things, and I sample a lot of different stuff grown in lots of different places and I, I get it. I think that it's important to to make sure that you know you are selecting genetics that are for your environment. What's going to do well in, in your particular situation. Again, you know, what grows on the West Coast um, isn't necessarily going to go very well in Oklahoma. You know, Oklahoma you have to find, you know, for me probably uh plants that have a very robust vac vascular system and the xylem and phloem are a little bit thicker than some of your uh, top heavy cultivars that that really require a lot of uh, trellis and um, bamboo sticks to be able to keep them from falling over just because of, of weight issues um, any type of compact plant will work extremely well um, but the, the wind is definitely a challenge here just because it picks up um, in this part of the country so much of the the dust from from big ag that we get a lot of uh, contaminants in um, a lot of the, the stuff that's grown here, especially if you don't have any type of wind protection. So. So. Hold on. That was so while we were talking here, I was having a side conversation with my family, and that's uh, my wife's nine month pregnant belly stacked up against my uh, 17 month coronavirus lockdown belly. Can you guys see that? No, you're frozen right now for us. Oh, really? Yeah, we see you looking at your computer and then the, the timer's at two hours and 17 minutes. Really? All right. Everybody else, are you seeing my belly stacked up against my wife's belly? So wait, you guys actually see me? Yes. I, I'm moving around, but... And on my it's side, really you see just a, a well, is, oh, wait, you know what? Sorry, hold on. Ah, fucker. Give me We're one. at the mercy of our technology. That's why I have <laughs> a, a wife that knows what she's doing. You don't see a beer belly right there? No. Oh, wow. So I weird. I see it. All right. Hey, I have, a, I have a double chin that I'm noticing that's pretty strong, so... 
this is um, very he, interesting. He did that super silver haze, and they haven't popped. He tried it and it didn't work, and he did the filing trick and the hydrogen phosphate trick. Mm. And then I brought up the. <laughs> what about Bob? No, thank goodness. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, you, you, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. And then I brought up the embryonic All right. This is trippy because. All right. Let me go to YouTube and see what I see. But anyway, we got a uh, Stony Rockefeller with. Uh, what's the name of the band? Catachronic. Catachronic in five, four minutes. But evidently, I'm frozen. That's an all right. Let's go back to you guys. Give me one second. To be able to answer the person's question about older genetics, so Al Beasley. Um, Al Beasley. Beasley. Al Beasley. I'm sorry if I'm mangling and I didn't see the initial comment, but um, I think depending on what state you're in, um, some of the tissue culture labs are able to handle some older seeds. So they they call it tissue uh, embryo or embryo embryo rescue. So you're actually able to take those seeds and they can kind of help along with the practice, especially if you have older cultivars uh, of genetics. I know that for me, I've been collecting genetics at a professional level um, since 98, but since 96 is whenever I started. Um, but yes, the cause. I don't know. I personally don't know the answer. I was trying to look it up, to be honest, to give it to you, but I didn't find anything. But anybody that is involved in tissue culture, um, especially outside of cannabis, um, still has that same knowledge. Obviously, when it comes to cannabis, tissue culture recipes are contingent upon the cultivar. So that is going to fluctuate a little bit. But as far as being able to utilize seeds that have been um, stored for a long amount of time, to be able to ensure the highest quality success rate with those seeds, it's better to, to have a professional or someone that's got an advanced degree that's worked with genetics that are a little bit older than that. Because you would hate to be able to take those and say that, you know, just because of um, oxification or just improper handling that they've developed like a scar tissue or they have a hardening um, that's not allowing the inside embryo to be able to crack that seed case, that they have methods that they can use that are able to take anything on the cellular level and and reproduce itself. I mean, that that's all the tissue culture really is at the end of the day is just taking a cell and then multiplying that same cell over and over and over and over and over. Um, I know that micropropagation is definitely the future of cannabis. Um, it's a way to be able to scale at such a faster pace than what anybody else um, can as far as stereotypical mother plants. Also, the fact that having to store mother plants reduces 15 to 20 percent of your total infrastructure. Um, you know, tissue culture is definitely the way to go. It, it ensures that you're working with a clean slate, especially coming from clones. So, um, anyways. <laughs> what? Do, do you, all right, this is trippy. Do you guys see it now? No, you're still frozen. That's so weird. Because I see me, but then in the stream I see my belly all right hold on that is so weird all right anyway what I was, but you can all hear me so let let let's wrap this we can always regroup on another day but I appreciate it Trish yeah. you you are providing insights from off camera and then eventually you you moved on camera <laughs> tried to i started feeling bad <laughs> uh yeah, she's take, part of it next time. yeah take back his emmy <laughs> <laughs> i was sad because so what i was trying to say before was in in my family chat that was going on on the side while we were talking uh there was a picture of my beer belly next to my wife's nine month Yes, Trish is the real MVP. Trish, do you see that comment in the chat? Oh. I agree with that 100%. You're too nice. You don't know the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm primarily the, the muscle and the, the one that, that does all the things that nobody wants to do just to get it done. And uh, 
She uh, helps keep me organized and understands my uh, my chaos just because I have, I don't know, I probably have some type of undiagnosed uh, mental disorder that I'm all over the place. I get it. I know that, you know, just once I rewatch all this, I'm going to be like, what in the fuck was I on? Because I think just, you did wonderful. But anyways, I'm glad to do okay. this. Happy to do well, it again. Well, thank you. So I'm going to kill this and uh, immediately start it back up with Stony Rockefeller's band, Catachronic. And they are rehearsing tonight, but rehearsing live for us. <laughs> so so we get we get to peek in on a, on a band rehearsal, which will hopefully be like playing a live show except from someone's living room. So anyway, Chase and Trish, I appreciate it. Uh, and we will, we will be back on again soon. And to everybody, uh, I'm gonna kill this and start it right back up. So if you wanna see Stony Rockefeller and Catachronic, stay right here. Thank Take you. care, everybody. Take care. Thanks, guys. Much love.